on the growing trend of ship from store distribution. My name is Paige Siplin and I'm the Executive Director of Georgia Center of Innovation for Logistics. As an industry-focused part of the Department of Economic Development, we are the state of Georgia's leading resource for fueling logistics industry growth and global competitiveness. I'm also your host for today's webcast. I'm joined today by two true experts on ship from store distribution, Adam Mullen, retail, lead, retail industry leader at Fortna, the professional services experts who help companies make distribution a real competitive advantage, and Scott Fenwick, who is the Senior Director of Product Strategy at Manhattan Associates the solutions provider, provider to global supply chain companies from all over the world. This is truly a clear and hot topic right now and will surely continue to be as logistics continues to evolve and grow for companies of all types and all sizes. Although some of the biggest retailers like Macy's, Nordstrom, and Toys R Us are already using ship from store to leverage their inventory and fulfill e-commerce orders, it's surely not as easy as it sounds. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Adam and Scott to begin today's conversation. Adam, take it away. Thanks everyone for your time today to talk about a subject that we are very passionate about, ship from store. Ship from store is a very hot topic right now. This was the primary topic at the last NRF and RELA conferences and is what I'm asked most often about as I consult with companies on their distribution strategies supporting omnichannel growth. I am sure you've heard about companies like Macy's leveraging their stores as distribution nodes. Likewise, Ann Inc. working to enable a ship from store model to support their desire to provide a seamless experience, take advantage of inventory in stores, and improve overall margin. So on today's webcast, I'll start out by taking it up a level and talking about the macro trends that are happening that cause this to be on retailers' minds. Then we'll talk about the impacts that a ship from store model has on companies, then I'll turn it over to Scott from Manhattan Associates, who will talk about the technology impacts of moving to ship from store. So gone are the days of single channel retailing, and we are all very guilty, whether it is because we are too impatient to wait 24 hours for Amazon to deliver it, or too lazy to drive to the nearest store to pick it up, we the consumer are behaving differently than ever before. The explosive growth of e-commerce has rocked retailing to its core. E-commerce has changed the retail landscape forever. The last major change was about 20 years ago with the advent of big box stores. Even now, retailers are still taking a heavy blow from the impact of e-com. E-com shopping continues to increase. For many retailers, it's their primary revenue growth driver. And online shoppers in the U.S. will spend over $300 billion in 2016, accounting for almost 10% of total retail sales. I found some very interesting statistics from several, several of our clients through this past holiday peak season. In particular, almost 50% of e-com orders were placed with tablet or mobile device, and we see that trending upwards this year. And many companies continue to change the rules of the game and influence expectations of customers, especially around service promises. As stated numbers for customers actually wanting same-day delivery are fairly low, but just by making the offer, companies have shifted the bar yet again. So a key term in all of this is omnichannel. It's pretty simple. Customers want a product where they want it and when they want it. And if you don't have it, they'll find it somewhere else. And companies are struggling because that customer doesn't think in terms of stores or online ordering or a tablet or Facebook or Pinterest and so on. They want it to look the same on their iPad and their computer, even though those are different technologies. And they want everything to work seamlessly and feel the same. It's all about a seamless experience and the best service possible. But it's even more complicated than that. To keep up, companies are moving to a fulfill from anywhere model. The more places I put my product and the easier it is to buy, the better chance I have to sell it. But ensuring it is profitable is a delicate balance. For example, have you seen the Best Buy kiosks in airports or hotels? where you can buy a tablet or headphones right by your gate prior to taking off on a long flight. You're going to see a lot more of this as retailers offer access to their product every place they possibly can. And that's why we're here to talk about Ship From Store today. It's one of the few important weapons that retailers have to fulfill from anywhere. Pricing, promotion, and packaging may be the flashy side of retailing, but the fulfillment side is the engine that makes all of that work. 
And fundamentally, Omnichannel will continue to drive change for all of us in this space. As it relates to ship from store as a competitive weapon, let's focus on the benefits and impacts to better understand what companies are up against. First off, why are companies doing this? Well, it provides a great opportunity to increase sales. By offering store inventory to a broader audience, whether that is an online shopper buying something that is out of stock at the DC, or someone standing in another store looking for a size or color is only available three states away. Secondly, by offering store inventory to other locations or channels, store markdowns do not have to be as aggressive, ultimately raising average unit retail price points. From a logistics standpoint, shipping from store can mitigate the need for store transfers or returning the product to the DC. Also, it may be more efficient to ship to local customers based on proximity. Probably the most important aspect for the actual consumer are the service benefits enhanced by ship from store. It really does arm retailers with a means to get product to the consumer quicker. A better way to live with returns and ultimately driving a more seamless experience. And as a bonus, ship from store may be able to offload volume during peaks at the DC to stores. Also, it could potentially eliminate DC constraints or postpone DC investments to support growth. Lastly, from a business continuity standpoint, retailers no longer depend on all of their inventory in just one location for a channel at a given time. There will be impacts to your efficiency though. Distribution center fulfillment is more efficient, consistent, and higher quality than store fulfillment. Store personnel have different skill sets, roles, and are generally more expensive than fulfillment personnel. Store associates are about engaging with the consumer. Their time is very valuable and meant to help drive sales. Taking them out of their role to ship boxes might cost sales. Most retailers are all about the customer engagement or experience. This is the component of retailing that technology will not be able to help solve. You'll need to think through your packaging and freight. Stores need allocated time, space, and equipment to pack, weigh, print labels, and stage outbound orders. Distribution centers have well-defined space and engineered stations to efficiently complete the packing process. Access to and management of partial pickups. Retail space is more expensive than the distribution center. Packaging from store must match that of the distribution center to ensure an omni-channel experience. Packaging, invoicing, return labels, cartons, fill must all look the same. Freight impacts at the store level could be meaningful. The economies of scale experience at the distribution center may no longer apply. Depending on your agreements with carriers, shipping 100 cartons a day from a store may be costly as compared to the DC. It is important to understand the overall impact of transportation costs. Ship from store requires you to rethink your channels, organization, and incentives. Omnichannel leaders and first adopters of leveraging stores for fulfillment no longer report revenue by channel anymore. We are seeing foundational changes within the various business units, all centered on consensus planning around the same enterprise selling goals. P&Ls are being shifted to ensure the proper departments are receiving fair credit for sales and fair allocation of costs. We all know the omni-channel strategy and specifically ship from store is valuable. It is just complicated to get there. Inventory coverage becomes key. If you have to get all the inventory across all the channels, regardless of where it is, now with stores involved, you have that many more locations to consider and cover. But the biggest impact of all is going to be your systems and technology. Most often, systems are the biggest barrier to entry for companies embarking on ship from store capabilities. Technology has gone from just the cash register, now all about converting systems to see the journey of the SKU, manage the fulfillment of orders inside and outside the distribution center, and arming associates with the tools required to provide seamless service. 
Scott Fenwick of Manhattan Associates is going to guide us through how companies are addressing the system side of the equation. Thanks, Adam. From a solution provider's window, the evolution to ship from store has certainly been an interesting one to follow, and certainly one of the hottest topics being discussed today. In many ways, it's forced enterprises to break down operational silos that have existed for many years. Distribution operations not only has to work closely with their e-commerce partners, but now they're dealing with store operations teams as well. And customers know far more about your supply chain than ever before. Simply by logging in online, I can see what inventory is available, I can see which locations actually have that inventory, and I can claim it. In Manhattan, we call this supply chain commerce. Supply chain commerce is where supply chain and the market meets. It's really about bringing companies and their customers closer to your supply chain. To succeed at supply chain commerce, you really need two key foundational elements. The first is a single view of inventory and customer transactions. This is how you leverage all of your network to make sure you have the right products available for commerce in the right channels. It's how you empower your customer service reps and retail sales associates with a complete history of customer interaction so that they can act quickly to satisfy their needs. It's about enabling revenue and building relationships and more specifically, building customer loyalty. At the same time, once you create those revenue opportunities, your network has to be able to respond. At any point in the network, could potentially become a, f a point of fulfillment. A single platform to manage all inventory, move product, and fulfill demand at not only your e-commerce DC, but potentially at supplier locations, where you may be doing drop shipment type programs, or your store, or otherwise enable your supply chain to act with speed and agility. In the I want it now culture that demands same day or next day delivery, you have two choices. Load up on cost and inventory, or have a platform that enables you to respond quickly and effectively. So let's take a look at this from a systems perspective. In Manhattan, we've used this illustration as one tool to articulate from a broader concept that the infrastructure that must be in place in order to enable this type of agility. In the center of this illustration, we have two foundational parts, which directly correlates to the, to the foundational items we mentioned before. The first is network inventory visibility. Network inventory visibility is not just about knowing where your inventory physically is within your various facilities. It's also about understanding what inventory is moving between locations, potentially from your supplier to your DC, from one store to another, and vice versa, and understanding when that inventory could be made available. Enterprise order management becomes another key component in this architecture. Its job is to basically marry up any point of demand or any customer touch point with the points of fulfillment that are available to it. Again, whether that's your DCs, your vendors, or your retail stores. And as we were preparing for today's presentation, it was interesting to see how closely this illustration aligned with the one that Adam had, had shared regarding Fulfill from Anywhere. We're seeing such a great increase in experimentation that's going on in the retail community as they attempt to find new ways to reach out and interact with their customers, whether that's through mobile technology or even some of the social platforms that are being leveraged to drive increased demand and conversion into actual orders. We're also seeing a lot of disparity on the, um, from a fulfillment perspective. We're seeing businesses like Belk, who have actually done a fair amount of ship from store over the years also leveraging their supplier base to do drop ship direct to consumer, completely bypassing their network. But perhaps most importantly, the biggest change that we're here to talk about today involves the store and leveraging the store's new technology. When we often talk about order fulfillment, we have a vastly different picture than the one portrayed on this particular slide. We typically think about distribution centers and the people that service the distribution centers and all the materials handling equipment that goes into those facilities to optimize them to service your direct-to-consumer business. But in today's world, in today's paradigm, your order fulfillment specialist just got a lot broader. Your store workforce is now being asked 
to play a key role in that business process. And they're, they operate in a different piece of real estate than your DCs. And the aesthetics behind those individuals is different. They're young, they use modern technology, and they change jobs often. And so as systems are designed to service this environment and these users, they really have to be purpose-built and directed towards this type of interaction. From an enterprise perspective, certainly Omnichannel is all about providing that seamless customer experience, ensuring that no matter how they shop and how they buy, that interaction remains consistent and feels like they're interacting with one retail brand. But from a store operations perspective, the goal is speed and accuracy. And the solutions that are provided have to be focused on those key elements. As Adam said, store associates are being asked to do new and different things. In the past, their focus was on servicing the walk-in consumer. Now we're also asking those same associates to go out and pick and pack and ship orders, which may be a, a foreign experience to them. Being able to do that quickly is paramount as the cost of labor in stores is high. But also without accuracy, obviously that, that likelihood that the consumer is going to enjoy that seamless experience when the, when the package arrives at their front door is, is going to be key. This also leads us to help understand and how we can start to measure the various costs within the store and control that co those costs most importantly. So let's look at what technology is needed in the store and what types of solutions are being introduced to help solve some of these challenges. First is order fulfillment. Obviously this is the topic of today's conversation and, and quite frankly it's the topic of, of most industry insight. Is there a lot of retailers are simply trying to figure out how do I start to leverage the inventory and the labor assets within my stores to better service my customers? Second is the concept of order management within the stores. Quite frankly, this involves ensuring that consumers shopping in your stores that can't find the inventory that they're looking for have options and your associates have technology that enables them to potentially find inventory across your network and if necessary, capture orders on behalf of the customer so that their needs are fulfilled, whether the inventory is located across town and the consumer wishes to drive across town to pick up that, that product, or potentially we might need to ship it to their home location, whichever means is most convenient for them at that particular time, therefore effectively saving the sale and converting that need into an actual transaction. And last but not least is store inventory. And it's been interesting as retailers have, have taken this journey, the, the idea behind store inventory is really driven by a couple of key assumptions. One is that store inventory accuracy is historically challenging, especially in various retail verticals. And by being able to increase that accuracy, not only do I enable myself to leverage that inventory more accurately to fulfill orders, but Retailers also get a lot of the additive benefits of increasing sales, reducing stockouts and empty shelves, and more accurate retail store replenishments. So let's break down a couple of key components here. And first we're going to talk about store order fulfillment. Store fulfillment takes on lots of different forms and fashions, whether your objective is to implement a ship from store program as we've, as we've touched on already today, a pickup in store program, or in more complex situations, perhaps you're looking to do more site-to-site -site transfers in order to save a sale. Take the situation where you have a consumer that's in one location, and it's the location that's most convenient for him, but does not have the inventory he's looking for. Perhaps that inventory could be located in another store, transfer it from one to the other, and again, save that sale and meet that customer's needs. From a store associate's perspective, these processes have to be very simple and easy to learn. As we've mentioned earlier, retail stores typically enjoy a very high rate of turnover in their workforce, and therefore they can't afford to spend a lot of time training new associates on new technology. The technology has to be 
sim as simple as possible given these, these are complex workflows and complex processes and easy to learn and on technology that they're most familiar and comfortable with. We've probably all seen the uh, now infamous Kmart I ship my pants video. And this is, in, in essence, while it's a, while, while it's a, a bit of a, a humorous attempt to poke holes at the, uh, at the idea of being able to ship from store, the seriousness and the complexity behind what the retailers are trying to do is still there. As we look to ship from store, we've had to look for new technology and new ways of interacting with things like, with businesses like parcel carriers that are different than we're more accustomed to in our distribution centers. Our e-commerce distribution centers are tooled with technology that is highly tuned to facilitate high volume transactions that can be shipped out of that inventory pile directly to consumers. However, as we're looking at deploying these same types of business processes across hundreds and maybe even thousands of retail store locations, we had to look to new ways to facilitate not only a rapid deployment, but a lower total cost of ownership overall. And as an example, the last thing you'd want after you've deployed ship from store across 500 store locations is to have to go back once a quarter and update your rating tables to make sure that you've got the most consistent and, and current and accurate shipping rates. Our perspective and the technology that we've leveraged at Manhattan is to leverage web services and do more direct integration with the parcel carriers such as Fellow Express and UPS. In this particular example, both have extended and exposed web services that we can take advantage of and therefore enable these, type, these same types of processes in retail stores, but they do all the heavy lifting. They manage the rate tables, whether it's negotiated rates that have been approved for the retailer or not. They create shipping, the shipping labels, which we then get to take advantage of and print in the store. Therefore, we don't have to go back and have labels recertified for each location by the carriers. They also offer real-time tracking information, electronic proof of delivery. So let's say, as an example, you're shipping a very expensive item or high margin item. Uh, or potentially it's an item that uh, the, the legally requires an adult signature upon delivery. Well, that information is also made available back to us, again, all through web services, so that we can render that information, we can track it within our system, and we can therefore potentially expose it to customer service so that they can, they can validate not only was the package delivered, but again, have some image of who signed for it, when, et cetera. This also brings up a, an interesting point regarding some of the logistics carriers. We have seen several retailers, mostly in the fashion space, that are leveraging US-based retail stores to ship goods overseas. Now this involves more complexity as now you have to deal with customs and customs documentation. And obviously that's not a burden that they wish to place on their retail stores as the likelihood of that being done and being done correctly uh, does start to go down. And in this particular example, we've seen a number of retailers leverage third-party logistics providers. Uh, one example is Border Free, used to be called 51. And essentially, from a US-based location, they're able to ship those goods, those packages, from the store to that 3PL, and it looks just like any other parcel that they may ship from store. And then that particular provider can handle the complexity of the customs documentation and all the international complexities that that again, you wish to mask the retail store associates from doing. The last component I wanted to touch on is really store inventory. And here again, it's been an interesting path to see how retailers have approached this problem. Um, the objective, as I stated earlier, is to increase inventory accuracy. We've had some, especially retailers, uh, mostly big box retailers, come to us, and their objective is to get to store fulfillment, they see inventory as a challenge and therefore they want to get their inventory accuracy in order first and therefore enable uh, future fulfillment programs to be implemented in the stores. Uh, their key challenge or the, the, the key insight that I think they brought to the table is that the last thing they want, given all the challenges we've, we've discussed with store associates so far this morning, the last thing they want is for a store associate to run around the store trying to find inventory that never was there to begin with. 
And so by improving that inventory accuracy, they have a higher likelihood that they can find that inventory first pass, reduce the cost of labor and time spent trying to track down the, the, the inventory itself. We've had other retailers, more so in the fashion world, that have chosen to dive right in to implement store fulfillment, understanding that inventory accuracy may still be a challenge, but then as a second phase or potentially a third phase of their project, layering in things like store level inventory management where they might be doing things like scan based receiving, inventory adjustments for known shrink, damaged items, etc., and even cycle counting to augment the typically once or twice a year physical inventory counts that, get, that typically get done in stores. And in often cases, they're doing this, as, a, as, a, as I said, as a future phase of the product under, uh, project, understanding that this enables them to get better and reduce the cost of, of the program that they've, that they've implemented, choosing, of course, to take the revenue before focusing on, in on that cost equation. The key behind each of these aspects in the store, again, is in making sure that the solutions that you choose for your store associates are purpose-built for the store associates. While we're talking about things like ship from store, partial shipping, receiving, et cetera, and these terms are, are terms that all of our operational teams are familiar with uh, for many years and, and managing them in our distribution centers, the stores are not DCs and the associates that work in them are not the same, they're not managed the same as the associates in our distribution centers. And therefore, the tools have to be purpose-built for that environment in order to make the transition uh, as easy and as cost-effective as possible. So just in summary, you know, we've talked about enabling a lot of processes in stores today. The one thing that we're seeing from a trend perspective is that as retailers get more experience in enabling Omnichannel in the store, they tend to start to focus on the profitability within that store operation. And we think in order to be profitable, in the retail store, you really have to focus in on four key areas. Of course, the new aspect is store fulfillment, all while keeping an eye on and providing great customer service to the walk-in customers. Inventory, as I, as I just mentioned, is another key aspect of, the, of that equation, and focusing on the inventory accuracy is key. But then, last but not least, focusing in on the store labor becomes the last final dial to turn in order to ensure that these operations are profitable. And as we're looking at labor, we're really talking about the effectiveness of the associate as they're performing these equations and these business processes, but also the ability to make sure that our staffing in the store is properly planned for so that we can avoid, if possible, having to pay overtime or potentially attempts to come in and ship what, what can be very large volumes, especially on cyber, cyber sale type events or online promotions, things, things of that nature. If we can do these four things, it enables the enterprise to respond to omnichannel in the store with accuracy, speed, all while managing and maintaining costs. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Scott. Thank you all again for joining us on this webinar. And thanks for that great look into the trend of ship from store. Sounds like we're early enough in this trend that most companies are still making their way and figuring out how to integrate it into their business, with some exceptions. And this is great information on the steps companies will need to go through to get to that next level of really achieving ship from store. Thanks to you both again. And now I'd like to turn it over to our audience for some questions. Um, if you have a question, please submit it through the, the chat feature you'll see on the side of your webcast console. Um, we've already had quite a few questions come in, so I'm going to go ahead and get started in with a couple um, that I picked out, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. The, uh, the first question we have is from Mike, who asks, how do companies get started on ship from store? Um, Adam, you want to try to take that first one for us? Absolutely, thank you. Uh, so how do companies get started? Uh, you know, when we sit down to have this conversation with companies, typically we, we like to understand how they've grown up. Grown up. Uh, so if you're a wholesaler breaking into the retail world, or maybe you're an e-commerce company with uh, an immature retail or brick and mortar store presence, um, it, it really just depends how you've grown up. If you've been fulfilling orders through a buy online, pick up in store, then I think you have a tremendous head start. If not, we see companies piloting a certain number of stores to start, maybe 10 or so. Uh, that way they can control the impacts to the business, um, test their capabilities without much initial investment. 
But, but again, as Scott explained, technology is the critical component. Um, and there's definitely some barriers to entry to enable your stores to actually ship an order, uh, even though the idea doesn't sound very hard at all. But regardless of your maturity, um, it's important that the actual business is, is all on the same page. Uh, you really understand who's going to get credit for the order, uh, whose P&L will be impacted, um, and how will you actually account or allocate those costs uh, associated with shipping from store. And certainly every business is quite different, and that visibility is, is key to making it all work, no matter what you do. Absolutely. We've got one more here. Um, let's move on to a question from Sam, who asks, uh, what are some of the toughest challenges companies you've worked with so far have faced when fulfilling orders in the stores. Um, Scott, how about you? You want to try to take that one? Sure, Paige, I'll take that one. Um, and, and again, it, it does depend on where they're starting and what types of processes they're implementing. A, as an example, for retailers that wish to implement buy online pickup in store, sometimes the biggest challenge is just getting that accurate real-time picture of inventory within, within the store. You know, most retailers have some form of trickle poll or inventory polling that's in, in place, but again, typically that's not real time. Uh, for some it is. But I, I would also say that at it, it, maybe a more of a general level, certainly the technology and implementing technology takes time, but often the single most biggest challenge is in, for the, is in the store operations team's ability to handle change. Um, some retailers we found are better than others at having tools and processes in place to roll out new systems across stores. And, and oftentimes that becomes the biggest barrier to how long these initial programs take. Good. So I, we just got another question in from Jeff asking about the biggest, um, well, Jeff has seen some problems around uh, the store being owned by one group or one leadership, set of leadership, and distribution is controlled by another set of leadership. Uh, how do companies actually get over the internal battles um, that naturally occur, and that, that's a great question. So we've, we've had this conversation with many companies and their leadership around consensus planning and all having one goal, and if someone buys online and decides to pick it up in the store, who actually gets credit, and then where do you allocate that cost? Um, so that's a big part of this discussion and really wrapping everyone's head around omni-channel in general. Um, we've seen some companies stop reporting revenue by channels. Uh, we've seen some companies start at the top and they are actually changing titles to director of omnichannel or director of omnichannel distribution, if you will. Um, so it really does start at the top. You have to have consensus planning. You have to be built around one goal. I think a good start, consumers no longer think in channels, so the business shouldn't either. <clears throat> Looks like we have another, uh, another question here. Um, how do we decide which stores we should start with? And again, these are, these are not straightforward questions perhaps, but in a lot of cases, as we've been working with retailers on deploying ship from store, um, this is a big question. Do I ship from all, all stores or do I cherry pick locations and, and, and leverage just those? In a lot of cases, it depends on, on the type of store, the physical layout. Um, as Adam had, had alluded to earlier, space is going to be required uh, to have packing materials if you're going to ship from store and, and to be able to physically you know, manage the, those activities. Um, there's also been some interesting work that's, that's starting to be done to start to look at the demand patterns that are being fulfilled from store, whether that's, it's online, mobile, et cetera, and then trying to leverage that as a way to be intelligent about which locations are, are, are also going to, going to be serviced and maybe choosing some of those, some of those first. Yeah, Scott, I think that's a good point. So the stores that may be in close proximity or demand centers, um, being able to leverage stores for the whole service level promise. So if I, I'm promising my customers I can get it there in a couple of days, I'm going to pick those stores that are closest to my demand uh, in order to really fulfill that promise, if you will, and focus on the speed aspects of omnichannel. I think ship from stores really can enable that speed side of the equation. Um, looks like we have another question that came in from Tom. Uh, with, multiple, with multiple locations, which presumably to choose from, the system, which systems find the closest locations or is it dealt with by, at an inventory level to ship from? What, and what is the hierarchy that's, that's recommended? Well, typically, Tom, I mean, in a lot of cases, the, the default is to ship from the e-commerce DC, of course. Uh, that's what the facility exists for, and it's been tooled to go manage that, that level of activity. As 
where the rules start to get more complex is as we start to look to the other facilities, whether it's stores or, or, or vendors. And there are typically a number of, of facets that come into play. Um, in a lot of cases, inventory availability is kind of the first check. Obviously, if, the, if we think the inventory is not available uh, for sale, then obviously it's not a good location to, to ship from. But even at that level, you have to figure out um, if the inventory is physically in the, case, in the location, is it truly available for sale? There, there is a key difference between being on hand and being available for sale as you, as you look at the other purposes that the store is trying to serve. We have to look at things like shipping costs, um, and we also have to look at things like store labor. Um, we have had a, a number of customers that, especially during these peak seasons, whether it's Cyber Monday or after a big promotional event, have just realized that at some point you have to cut orders off of the store. Um, and we've had some examples where we've sent hundreds of orders uh, to store locations that, you know, at some point you just have to decide that this is more than they can handle uh, given the size store, given the, the labor that's available in the store, and, and therefore we need to look on to other, other types of, of, of facilities. And, and I think that the real key here is, is in having the flexibility to be able to, to configure those rules to meet your business needs, because every retailer is not going to have the same type of hierarchy. But typically this decision making, in our experience, exists in that order management layer that we talked about earlier. So Kim has a question about what other technologies are being leveraged around ship from store. So I think, I think there's two that we didn't necessarily talk about that, that we hear a lot of companies talking about. One is RFID. Uh, some folks think RFID is going to be as important as, important as a label uh, on the garment or on the shoes or on the accessory. So if you're shipping from store, it's important to know where all your inventory is. If I order that one gray polo, that large tall, and it happens to be on the floor in the dressing room, it'd be nice to know where it is. Uh, we've heard companies like Macy's talk about the importance of RFID in their stores as they're starting to leverage a ship from store model. I think the other technology that's pretty important as we talk about shipping from stores is geo-tracking. So the ability to track and trace and talk to mobile devices. The second somebody walks in your store, you know what they've bought, you know they, how, how they behave in your stores, you know they may be in a certain area of your store looking at something and you can then help them understand what else is in that store, or identify a product that them, they may like or recommend to them while they're in that store. Um, or you notice they're walking away and you know what area of the store they were in. You can offer up that, hey, we have other stores with that and we can still get it to you. Um, so I think those are a couple other technologies that are out there uh, that we've seen and talked about. There's another question that just came in from Dan. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts about the types of orders that may not be applicable to FedEx and UPS. Do you see store-to-store -store transfers? Uh, and the answer is yes. I mean, the, the, one of the, the key questions that retailers have to decide upon as, as we're thinking back to these rules that I just mentioned, which products are going to be eligible to ship? Um, when you look at, uh, say, sporting goods, it might make perfect sense to ship baseballs, um, baseball gloves, uh, uh, certainly apparel, but it may not make sense to ship canoes out of your retail stores, but given the cost and the complexity of, of managing that. And that's where, in a lot of cases, you have to make the decision. Are we simply going to offer those types of products uh, for pickup and store? Um, or are we going to leverage different types of partners, um, such as the you know, 3PLs, freight forwarders, et cetera, delivery, delivery firms? We've seen some, some more recent interest in, in things like that that can do that you know, same-day delivery or set up some type of a delivery service that, that can handle the bigger, bulkier, bulkier items. But that does become a, a key question that has to be addressed as they're working through the, the business rules behind what's going to ship from store, what's not going to ship from store. Certainly other things like um, uh, we, we've seen in the pet supplies industry, well, they, they certainly don't want to ship uh, aquariums. The, the, uh, the general consensus there is once they get into the store, as long as it's not broken, we're going to leave it in the store until it's bought because the likelihood of being able to move it again is, is low without breaking it. So you have to be sensitive to those types of things. So we had one question asking about reverse uh, logistics or returns. And Scott, we can, we can kind of maybe tag team this one. But <clears throat> if, if, if the return is coming to the store, so I bought, I bought online, it shipped to my house, and we see a lot of companies offering free returns to stores, or maybe you send it back. If you do return that one item to the store, maybe that's not offered as part of the store assortment. They may be able to quickly get that item online and offer it up back to the whole e-commerce world. Um, or maybe they decide they're going to send that back to the DC. Uh, obviously, I, we, we see a lot of companies 
liking to get all the returns in one location back to distribution centers potentially if you've bought online that's that's typically their strategy but Scott I don't know if you have anything else to add on the return side of the equation yeah Adam I mean it, it is a different difficult one um, as retailers are, are striving to provide that that seamless experience and high levels of customer service certainly the the flexibility and I, I would say the um, the openness to accept returns has increased I mean how often do you receive a package that's been shipped to your home that does not have some level of return instructions, uh, or in some cases, it's actually already shipped with a potential free return label if you want to drop it back in the mail and return it uh, to the retailer. And these are things that have to be considered, especially when you're implementing ship from store. Um, you have to think about, you know, what type of information do I have to include in that package in, in terms of managing the returns. But, you know, at a more systemic level, you also have to make sure that if the consumer purchases product and let's say they don't ship it back, let's say they want to walk it back in the store to return it directly and maybe exchange it for something else, what infrastructure needs to be in place to ensure that the store associate can have access to and understand uh, that transaction, whereas that transaction could have started online, a mobile phone, another store. And so kind of back to some of the things I talked about earlier in terms of enabling a single view of the customer and all of, all of her transactions becomes important in, in figuring out ways to make sure that that is seamlessly available to the in-store associates is going to be key as well. Good. We've had quite a few questions around the efficiency aspects of the store. So some are asking about the cost differences of fulfilling an order at a store versus at the distribution center. Um, we, we, this comes up a lot because it's part of the whole balancing the cost and service um, as you're starting to look at the ship from store model, but it, as it pertains to some of the efficiencies or the, the cost aspects act, actually picking and packing and fulfilling an order, at the store if you actually have the space and you can properly design a pack station, you can actually have a standard process in place to pack out an order, you can mitigate some of those major cost differences. We've even seen companies start to hire fulfillment specialists for their stores that are working in the back room and maybe they send them to the distribution center to get trained on the processes that they've already developed for their product handling characteristics. Um, Scott, you talked a lot about additional paperwork and some of the things needed at the back end of the store. What other types of, of things are we seeing around mitigating those costs associated with that labor at the store and then maybe also the, the technology component? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great topic. And as we've seen over the years, we know that there are, as Adam alluded to, there are retailers that have chosen to segment that labor pool, such as Nordstrom, we know that they have dedicated people in certain stores that all they do is pack and ship orders and prepare them for in-store pickups, but that's not necessarily the model that would work for a lot of smaller retailers. And so we're, we're seeing a number of things that are, that are being attempted, and, and again, there's a lot of experimentation, there's a lot of quick learning, because again, you have to tailor the, ex, the, the experience to the environment in the retail stores, but we are certain, certainly seeing a number of retailers that are doing things like bulk picking. Um, perhaps they batch up orders um, in, it, at certain times throughout the day, go out, pick all the orders at once, and then use that as a way to kind of go back and get, get the uh, activities done off hours. In some cases, you might have people that come in early before the store opens, pick all the orders that have queued up overnight, and facilitate the packing and shipping before the first customer ever walks into the front door. We're also seeing a lot of energy be, being put into mobile. Um, obviously, when we're looking for efficiency, being able to have the right tools in the sales associates' hands as they're out working on, this, on, on the floor becomes key because in a lot of cases, um, if you're out trying to pick inventory for an order, that you, it's, there's a high likelihood during normal sales hours that you're going to be interrupted by a customer that needs your assistance and you have to be able to stop help that customer and then very quickly uh, jump right back into the activities that, uh, that you were facilitating. And mobile just certainly makes this a lot easier. So maybe one last question. Someone asked about the biggest business impact, increase in sales, inventory optimization, maybe something else. Um, I will tell you earlier this year, first, second quarter, we heard companies reporting 20 plus percent increase in profits and they attributed a lot of that to their ability to go tackle some of the initial omni-channel desires, a lot of that around ship from store. Um, we think it's probably a bit early to tell exactly the biggest, biz single biggest business impact. Sales is definitely part of it. Inventory productivity or optimization is definitely part of it. Um, Scott, I don't know if you have anything to add to that as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely agree. Revenue is the, that's the shiny new thing in the quarter that everybody's trying to get out of those stores. 
Obviously, that does have an impact on inventory turns in the stores uh, from a positive perspective. There's also been some nice, nice movement, although we've not gotten a lot of published measures on this in terms of margin. Um, Adam, I think you actually alluded to earlier to the idea that you know finding new creative ways to take distressed inventory from the stores and leverage your your online channels to go sell that inventory has yielded some nice benefits for retailers that are a little bit more on the forefront of that. Uh, being able to sell that inventory that would have been marked down at full price suddenly has a nice gain in terms of margin. Perfect. Yep. Agreed. Well, thank you, everyone. We're going to call that a, a webinar. Um, you can see Adam and Scott's contact information on the screen in front of you. Um, certainly experts, as you can tell, just in these few minutes we've spent together. Please reach out to them directly if you have other questions. And also feel free to reach out to us if we can help you here at the center in any way. Uh, we appreciate your time today and hope you found this information useful. Following this web webcast will be a quick survey to let us know your thoughts about today's event and future topics you'd like to hear us talk about. Your feedback is greatly appreciated and really important for us to be able to come up with topics that are important to you. Uh, we'll also hope you'll join us on those upcoming webcasts that we host here at the Center of Innovation for Logistics. We're going to be talking about other aspects of technology, maybe a deeper look at the U.S. infrastructure and how underinvestment is impacting private industry. Um, and with that, we thank everyone again for coming and have a great day.